Welcome everybody to um, our webinar here on living well with glaucoma, tips and innovative technology solutions. And here at Quantum, we're really delighted to join with um, Glaucoma Australia today in um, presenting and bringing this webinar to you. So we have Sapna Nan, Senior Patient Educator at Glaucoma Australia, who will be uh, presenting and giving you information on glaucoma and uh, how you can use the supports and the services that Glaucoma Australia provide. And we also have Peter Cracknell, who's our manager at Vision and Blindness Technologies here at Quantum, and he'll be talking about the assistive technology side of things. So, and I'm Rebecca Clark, and um, I'm doing the facilitating today. So um, I'd just um, like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which this webinar is being presented and pay our respects to elders past and present. And um, for me, it's the Darug um, people here in uh, northwestern, what's known now northwestern Sydney. Uh, so, yeah, so just a little bit of housekeeping for anyone that might not have attended our webinars before. So your microphone will be muted during the webinar, but we will have a couple of different times for questions. And if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A area by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, or you can get there by tabbing if you're a key, um, keyboard user, or you can put them in the chat area. And to get to that, it's Alt and H or Command and K on a Mac or clicking on the little bubble icon. If you do have any technical difficulties, please also use the chat and I'll monitor that. And we are recording the session, so that will be made available afterwards once it's ready and will sent, be sent to you via email. And live caption should be enabled uh, if you need to use those. So um, just as a little bit of um, uh, introduction and overview of what um, we're going to go through uh, in today's session. So after this little bit of an introduction, uh, Sapna will be presenting a bit of an overview of glaucoma and talking about who can be on your team if you're managing um, glaucoma and also how Glaucoma Australia can help. We'll then have a, a, some Q&A um, around her presentation. So I have questions for Sapna. Uh, then Peter uh, will... Uh, be presenting about uh, different assistive technology solutions that we have here at Quantum for people with low vision in, and specifically related to glaucoma today. And then we'll have um, more time for questions around that. And then we'll have our contact information and summary. So here at Quantum, as you may know, we're an assistive technology company. We've been around for 35 years or more now. And um, yeah, we can work with you and help you provide, help you uh, get access to different solutions, as Peter will explain later. So I'll stop sharing and hand over to Sapna. So Sapna, as I said, is senior educator at uh, patient educator at Corcoma Australia. So thank you very much for joining us, Sapna, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Good morning, Rebecca and Peter. Um, thank you for inviting Corcoma Australia this morning for the webinar. Um, so last time around we did this, we discussed um, lifestyle tips, living with glaucoma, and um, I'll just share my screen. So today we will go through the support system. Um, okay. So these are the health professionals involved in patient care for a person with glaucoma, and we'll just go through their roles and how they can help you. Um, glaucoma is one of the leading causes of irreversible blindness worldwide. So that means that any vision loss due to glaucoma actually can't be reversed. About one in 10,000 babies are born in glaucoma um, and it does increase with age. So by age of 40, about one in 200 have glaucoma and this rises to one in eight by the age 80. In Australia, we have around 300,000 Australians with glaucoma, and we do believe that this number is growing. 50% um, of those actually don't know that they have it. Um, reason being is because glaucoma doesn't have any obvious signs and symptoms, so people can miss it. So without an eye test, you can actually be living with glaucoma and not know that you are getting vision damage at the back of your eye. 
one in 50 Australians will develop glaucoma in their lifetime. And there is currently no cure, which means vision loss can't be reversed. But good news is that there is treatment um, that can preserve the vision that you have. You are 10 times more likely to get glaucoma if you have a direct relative with glaucoma. Okay, so glaucoma is usually caused by an increase in eye pressure, which damages the nerve at the back of the eye. Normal eye pressure is between 10 to 21, but it doesn't mean that if you are within this eye pressure range that you can't have glaucoma. Um, there is such thing as normal tension glaucoma, and there is such thing as having high eye pressure but not have glaucoma. And the level of elevated eye pressure which causes the damage at the back of the eye is actually different between each person. So it's best that people with glaucoma don't actually compare eye pressures to determine if it is under control, if their specialist is doing a good job with um, treating them. So as mentioned before, some people can have eye pressure without glaucoma. Um, this is called ocular hypertension, but they are at risk of developing glaucoma down the track. So they might still receive the same treatment as a person with glaucoma has. Um, if you are living with high eye pressure without having glaucoma, you still won't know that you have that unless you go for an eye test. And then we do have people who have normal eye pressure, but they actually have glaucoma, meaning they're still getting nerve damage even within these normal eye pressure range. Um, and all forms of glaucoma, um, a treatment aims to reduce eye pressure. Each person has a different target eye pressure. So each person with glaucoma will have a different treatment plan set by the eye specialist. So as I mentioned before, glaucoma is high eye pressure. It damages the nerve at the back of the eye. Now this nerve damage actually causes vision loss on the side, which is why it can be missed as well because nobody really ever checks their side vision. So over here, we can see there's a picture here with somebody without glaucoma. And then by the time you have mild or moderate loss, you can see those kids disappearing from that vision. So what happens is your brain fills in these gaps and you might miss these kids actually crossing the road um, after that ball. And then by the time you have severe vision loss, you might miss those cars there as well. Um, so that's what vision might look like for a person with mild to moderate um, and severe glaucoma compared to somebody who does not have any side vision loss. Um, these are some of the risk factors of glaucoma. So if you are of African or Asian descent, um, diabetes being very long or short-sighted. So if you always have had a high glasses power. Um, if you are on long-term steroid use, if you uh, are a migraine sufferer, if you've had an eye operation or injury in the past, you can also develop high eye pressure. History of high or low blood pressure, and if you have sleep apnea. So these are all risk factors of somebody who could develop glaucoma down the track. Um, having a family history puts you at 10 times more risk of getting glaucoma. Um, if a person in your family has advanced glaucoma, we recommend getting testing done five to 10 years earlier than the onset of glaucoma for that person. So glaucoma can be detected quite early on and does not have to advance like that family member. And as we mentioned before, it does increase with age as well. If you have something called thin corneas, which is the front part of the eye, and then high eye pressure. So you might have high eye pressure, not have glaucoma, but you are at risk if you don't treat that pressure. Okay, so how is glaucoma detected? So the, there are some eye tests that can be done. This can only be done by an ophthalmologist, which is an eye specialist or an optometrist. So um, they test the eye pressure, test the drainage angle of the eye. They examine the back of the eye with a big microscope. Um, there's something called a visual field test, which is like a map of your entire field of view to see if there is any side vision loss at all. Um, an OCT scan actually scans your optic nerve. Um, it can detect very, very early onset of glaucoma, even before the person experiences any vision loss or anything comes up on the visual field test. And then the uh, corneal thickness. Now, Glaucoma Australia recommends that all Australians age 50 or over visit an optometrist every two years for a full eye examination. Um, and then if you have a family history of glaucoma or, or Asian or African descent, get your eyes checked every two years from the age of 40. 
If your family member has advanced glaucoma, attend regular eye health checks commencing five to 10 years earlier than the age of onset of your affected relative. So all you have to do is go to an optometrist and say, I would like a baseline glaucoma test, or I have a family member with glaucoma, and then they can do all the testing that they need to. Um, and then from there on, they might monitor you, they might call you back every two years, or they might refer you to an eye specialist for further examination. Now, although there is no cure for glaucoma, most people are able to manage their condition successfully with the use of eye drops, laser or surgery. Sometimes all three combinations are needed to actually get the eye pressure down to the level needed for that person. The purpose of all glaucoma treatment is to lower the eye pressure within the, um, within the eye in order to prevent deterioration of the optic nerve, which causes vision loss. So it's all about causing that um, the damage to the optic nerve. Now, if there is already optic nerve damage, we can't reverse it, but we can pause that damage, meaning that vision gets preserved as well. And it's important to remember that treatment cannot restore your vision. Um, so sometimes we do get people saying or asking, why do I need to be on this treatment if I if it's actually not making my vision any better. So it won't make it better, but it can preserve the vision you have, meaning you can maintain your quality of life with the current vision you have. Um, and early detection is quite important here because the earlier it's detected, the earlier we start treatment, um, meaning it doesn't have to actually impact your quality of life. All right, so um, eye drops is the most common form of treatment for glaucoma, and um, it works in two ways. It reduces the amount of fluid created by the eye, and it also increases the outflow of the um, fluid. So it's, it's all to get the, um, the right pressure within the eye. There are quite a few different types of eye drops. Some people need, uh, are okay with one, some need a combination of three or four. Um, and only an eye specialist can recommend and prescribe these drops so you know sometimes we do get people calling up saying my friend is using these eye drops working pretty well for them can i have them the answer is no because they look at quite a few things before prescribing these drops um even the um current health conditions the target eye pressure what type of glaucoma they have so there's quite a bit that goes into it then there's laser treatments um so there's two types of laser one is called slt um, it treats open angle glaucoma. So 90% of cases in Australia is open angle glaucoma, and that reduces the eye pressure. Then we've got the iridotomy, which is for the narrow angle glaucoma, which is around 10% of the population. Um, laser treatment um, is not permanent, but it can reduce the eye pressure and then it can be repeated as well. And then there's surgery. And again, there are different types of surgery available. Um, trabeculectomy is the um, oldest type of surgery, it's still the gold standard in glaucoma surgery, and then we've got the MIG surgery and the drainage devices. Once again, the surgeon will pick the surgery which will give the patient the best result. So getting the newer types of surgery is not necessarily the best um, uh, type of surgery for that person. Now, the other thing to remember is that glaucoma um, Sorry, it is a ongoing um, condition. It's a lifelong condition, meaning ongoing treatment and ongoing appointments and management is important. So things to remember is that glaucoma cannot be self-detected. Um, only an optometrist or an ophthalmologist are equipped to test for glaucoma. With early detection and the correct treatment and management plan, you can save your sight. We recommend to get tested and attend all your eye care appointments to keep it under control. The treatment plan can change at any time. So you could be on one type of eye drop for 10 years and then all of a sudden it could stop working for you. So these ongoing appointments, um, it is important to ensure that you are on the correct treatment plan at all times. Um, so keep up with the appointments and treatment and remember to inform your family to get tested as well. And um, just to recap on that, so it is uh, glaucoma does cause irreversible peripheral vision loss due to optic nerve damage. Um, early vision is unnoticed, so there's no early symptoms. Regular eye, uh, we need to do regular eye tests for those at risk. But even if you aren't at risk, every, um, an eye test every two years should be done for every Australian. 
Glaucoma is a progressive condition where treatment can change at any time. This makes it very important to um, adhere to your treatment and ongoing appointments. Um, so because glaucoma is a lifelong condition, um, the relationship with your healthcare professional is also lifelong. So for a glaucoma patient, you've got your ophthalmologist who is the main person um, who will be who will be the one to diagnose and come up with a treatment plan and um, they can do surgery, laser treatment, provide you with the correct management plans. We've also got the optometrist who plays a big role um, in uh, management for glaucoma patient and most glaucoma is detected actually by the optometrist at first because most people actually just go in for a normal eye check and then find out they have glaucoma. Then we've got the orthoptist who works with the ophthalmologist. Um, we've got your pharmacist who will dispense your eye drops and they're the experts in medications. And you've also got your GP who is there for um, you know, referrals, um, scripts, they can also take care of um, if you have minor eye infections and any changes to your health conditions. <clears throat> All right, so the ophthalmologist is the eye doctor, or some people call it the surgeon or the eye specialist. And they are the only ones qualified to actually do the laser um, treatment and the surgery. The ophthalmologist will be the main person to do the diagnosis, the treatment and management plans. Follow-up appointments are quite important um, and they will be the ones to make the decision in case you need to change treatment. So if you need to change eye drops, try laser, surgery, there's also oral medications for some cases of really high eye pressure if none of those work or if they're waiting for surgery. Um, they will also confirm the safety of other medications. So for example, some people with glaucoma can't take antihistamines or cough mixtures or steroids. Um, so the ophthalmologist will know if it's suitable for you or if you can take it because they are the ones aware of your condition, how well controlled it is, what are the things that can affect it. And let's just say somebody does have side effects to their medications. You have to confirm with the ophthalmologist if it's okay to stop using it and then they'll call you back in for any change of treatment plans. The optometrist is often the first point of contact for anybody experiencing problems with their eyes. Um, and they are often the first person to flag glaucoma. So a lot of people do actually go in for glasses check and then they find that it's glaucoma that's been affecting the vision as well. Or they might go for a regular eye check and have glaucoma. Obviously, there's no symptoms, but the optometrist is well equipped to pick it up. Um, and most optometrists are trained to actually prescribe you eye drops for glaucoma if needed, but at some point they will have to refer the patient off to an eye specialist. Um, and so let's just say an optometrist does pick up any complicated or serious um, eye condition, they will most likely refer them then to an ophthalmologist for further consultation, diagnosis, but the optometrist will always be involved in ongoing care of a glaucoma patient. So as mentioned before, most people go to the optometrist for a glasses update, for new symptoms, eye infections is one that you can go to them. So, you know, even if you are a glaucoma patient and you start having eye infections, you don't have to consult your ophthalmologist for that. Your optometrist can, um, you know, diagnose a type of eye infection and, and put you on the right treatment plan for that. They can also examine your eyes for side effects and confirm, is it a glaucoma um, eye drop side effect? Is it something else? If you need a new referral, let's just say you would like to change specialists for whatever reason, an optometrist can help you out with that. If you are somebody who is an ongoing suspect for glaucoma, so you don't have glaucoma yet, but you're at risk of it, your optometrist can monitor you for glaucoma until there is a need to refer to an eye specialist. Uh, and they can do all the baseline testing. Now, we often do have patients who, um, they might have their glaucoma appointments say every year. So for the next 12 months, they might have high anxiety about their eye pressure, not knowing what's going on. Um, you can always hop into your optometrist for eye pressure checks as well. They're always available to see you in between appointments as well. And it is also a good idea to discuss a shared care plan between an ophthalmologist and, um, and an optometrist. So let's just say again, if you see your uh, ophthalmologist every like 12 months, it's good to see your optometrist every six, mo um, six months in between, just to make sure that nothing changes in that time 
um, you know, your eye pressure is going um, according to plan. And um, if something does come up, that your optometrist can always have a chat to your ophthalmologist to see if they need to step in sooner than that appointment. So an ophthalmologist is somebody who um, traditionally works with eye muscles. Um, they also work in low vision clinics, rehabilitation, and they will often be the first person you will see when you go and see an ophthalmologist. So they will be the one doing all the pre-testing before you see this specialist. So all the OCT scans, the eye pressure check, the um, field test. You can discuss your concerns with the orthoptist before you see the ophthalmologist. So they can always note down your concerns so the ophthalmologist is aware of it before you go into the room to see them. If you are having difficulty putting in drops, they can always help you with the techniques. Um, they will do all the pre and post surgery testing Let's just say you go in for your appointment to the specialist and then you remember something after the appointment. You can always call up the eye clinic and the orthoptist may be able to answer some questions as well, looking at the notes. And um, you might um, be seen by an orthoptist if you are um, going to a low vision clinic or going through rehab for any low vision purposes. Okay, so your pharmacist, um, they are the experts on medications. Um, and um, so they will be the one to dispense your drops. They also will have a lot of knowledge on your suitability to different medications, eye drops, side effects. Let's just say, um, you know, you would like to start a new vitamin for glaucoma. For example, we've got vitamin B3. You can have a chat to the pharmacist to see if that's suitable for you. If you have to start um, a new a medication for, let's just say, um, heart condition, but you're concerned how it will affect your glaucoma, your pharmacist might be able to help you out with that as well. So you can discuss a lot with your pharmacist, anything related to eye drops, other medications, existing health conditions, new health conditions. Um, so here we have it. So they'll help you with purchasing the glaucoma drops. They can also help you with installation techniques as well. Sometimes they might have some eye drop aids available at the pharmacy, which can help inst uh, instill some of the drops as well. They can help answer questions about medication, interaction of glaucoma drops with other medications. Um, another thing that can really help you out with is dry eyes. So glaucoma drops can aggravate dry eyes as well. And even without glaucoma drops, you might have dry eyes. Um, the pharmacist can help you pick the most suitable out of the whole range of products available in the store as well. Also with things like lid hygiene and blepharitis. Um, they will be able to assist you with choosing the right products, anything eye related pretty much. And then there's your GP or your family doctor. Now your GP can write scripts out for you, renew your scripts. Um, however, at some point they will refer you back to the specialist. So we sometimes do have patients who might go to the GP only for two years, three years for scripts renewal and skip those appointments with a specialist. Um, at some point, your GP will recommend that you go back and see your specialist just to make sure that those are the correct drops that you're on. And the GP can also help you if you need a new referral um, to see the current specialist or a new specialist. Okay, and then we'll um, go on to Glaucoma Australia and that's us. So our purpose is to improve the lives of people with glaucoma and those at risk by increasing early detection and positive treatment outcomes through education, advocacy, and research. We empower individuals to take an active interest in and understand their own eye health. We promote research, innovation, and work with the eye and eye care professionals. You can always reach out to Glaucoma Australia first if you are lost on where to start. Um, so, these are the common questions we get. So uh, we can obviously help out with the time you're at risk of glaucoma to living with glaucoma. But we've noticed patients like to ask a lot of lifestyle questions. So vitamin B3, yoga, weightlifting, swimming, impacts of caffeine. Um, you might be told that you need to um, now change treatment plans from say laser, um, like to laser or surgery. So we can help you with that as well. Answer questions on what the treatment, change of treatment means, provide you with more information, risk factors, questions to ask, um, answer questions on side effects of eye drops, recovery after surgery. So if you've had surgery, we can follow up just to make sure you're on track and recover well from surgery. 
Um, shock of new diagnosis. So it is a shock at times learning that you have glaucoma, especially if you go in for a glasses check or you come out knowing that you have a potentially blinding eye condition. Um, you know, we give you tips on coping with living with glaucoma and then also where to go for help. So if you are lost on a certain um, issue you have, if we can't help you, we can always guide you on which health professional to reach out to. We provide individual tailored um, calls and emails. Um, so we help provide helpful glaucoma suspects, new diagnosis and long-term ongoing um, diagnosis. We prepare you for upcoming appointments, discuss outcomes of recent appointments. So if you do ever forget to ask a question or something pops up afterwards, you can always call us up. And we also provide ongoing calls for those with high anxiety, just to check in on the emotional well-being as well. And the ways that you can contact us is our free support line, um, our website, you can SMS us now, email, we've got web chat, newsletters, social media, and you can always sign up for our newsletters. It's all free as well. We do have support groups set up online. So we have our Glaucoma Australia support group, which has over 1500 members. They're all Australians with glaucoma. We have a congenital group set up for families with kids with glaucoma. Um, the support groups do run 24 hours. It's private and secure, and it, it is regulated by qualified for professionals who work for us. Um, a recent survey that we did showed us that patients supported by Glaucoma Australia have 92% adherence rate, meaning that they attend their appointments 92% of the time and um, they comply with their treatments. They have reduced anxiety compared to those who aren't on our support system. And they actually have an increased understanding of glaucoma um, and they feel empowered by that, that to have an increased understanding of their own condition. Okay. Now, as much as our goal at Glaucoma Australia is to save vision uh, loss from glaucoma, there are cases where people will get vision loss from glaucoma no matter what. Um, and it is good to get prepared. Um, you know, with low vision services and who are the health professionals involved in um, low vision care. So glaucoma often does not result in low vision loss. Um, however, in some cases it can. Those who experience a decline in the quality of life and or increased disability, even in early stages of glaucoma, are likely to benefit from low vision intervention. Therefore, low vision services should be considered as a part of a holistic care plan when managing glaucoma. So some of the challenges reported by people um, who start experiencing vision difficulty with glaucoma are adapting to um, changes in lighting. So they notice that uh, this a lot when they are reading or doing um, close-up work at home, even preparing food um, for cooking. Um, they have trouble seeing in dim or dark environments. They do complain of blurred vision, difficulty with glare. Um, this could even involve um, night driving notable field loss and reduced contrast sensitivity. When it comes to mobility, people commented on difficulties with steps, shopping and crossing roads. These challenges correlated with increased risks of fall, restricted physical activity and reduced quality of life. As mentioned before, they do um, mention um, reading um, abilities reduced with glaucoma. Even if they have good vision, they find that um, small print can become hard, text on TV can become quite hard. And then driving. Um, so um, there are new rules out for driving now. So anyone over age of 70 has to be tested every year for um, keeping their license, um, especially with their vision. So um, uh, with driving, they will test your distance vision, but they'll also test your peripheral visual field, um, a combined binocular test. And we found that more and more people with glaucoma, or as they get older, they actually surrender their own license because they feel unsafe driving or they only drive um, close by or in the daytime, they give up night driving as well. Um, so the organisations that you could reach out to is Save Vision Australia, Guide Dogs, and then there's also referrals you can get to low vision clinics. The health professionals involved in low vision services are a low vision orthoptist, occupational therapist, and there's also an orientation and mobility specialist. So if you do reach out to these organizations, um, they can get you in touch to be assessed by one of these health professionals. 
We also have vision aids um, available on our online shop, um, which is provided by Quantum. So, um, but what we did find is that um, a lot of first time vision aid users would like to actually trial vision aids before they try it because there's such a big, huge range. Um, so what we recommend is you can visit um, our website and our shop and you can give us a call. They can also contact Quantum um, to actually discuss which vision aid would be most suitable for you before you purchase it through their online shop. So these are all the ways you can contact Vision Australia. Um, so just to recap again, um, glaucoma is a lifelong condition. You need to be comfortable with everyone in your support network. Be confident about the decisions made regarding your eye health. Um, it's important to trust in the expertise of the eye care professionals. It's important to understand and adhere to treatment and management plans in order to save the health of your eyes and maintain your quality of life. Thank you. Thank you, Sapna. That's great. So, um, oh, yeah, we're just seeing a video. Oh, so, yeah. Great. Great. Thank you for that, Sapna. So, yeah, if anyone's got any questions um, for Sapna, specific to glau glaucoma or services and things, we can um, answer those. Might not be able to answer your specific, you know, if it's very specific to your condition, that's probably something more for your specialists. But, uh, yeah, we have had one Sapna um, that says their mother developed glaucoma after receiving treatment from... AMD, does this make me a higher risk or is her glaucoma not passed genetically? Uh, glaucoma is genetic um, and so is macula. So we would recommend going and seeing the optometrist first, letting them know that um, mum has macular degeneration and glaucoma and they will start to get all the testing done. Um, and from there on, um, recommend a even a yearly eye check um, for macula and glaucoma will be great. Um, so I would say definitely get your eyes checked at the optometrist and take it from there. Okay, thank you. And we did have one submitted um, on the registration, somebody asking about they, they've had glaucoma for 20 years and um, just had a stent um, put in. So um, we're asking about uh, ongoing management of, of that. How should they find out about that? Um, so even with having an eye stent in, um, you would still be seeing your specialist as normal for ongoing appointments just to make sure that the stents are doing its job and your pressures are still well controlled in the limits they need to be. Um, sometimes even after surgery, drops can be reintroduced. Um, hopefully not, but the specialist will be able to guide you with ongoing appointments. Okay, thank you. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Um, oh. oh, okay. Someone said if someone travels from overseas to Australia, would be you be able to treat them that yeah, definitely. So um, best thing to do would be, again, to start off at an optometrist, let them do all the baseline testing to see um, what the glaucoma is like. Carry on with the usual eye drops that you would have from overseas. So don't stop your treatment, but um, hop into the optometrist with the current eye drops and then the optometrist can um, arrange a referral to an eye specialist in Australia from there on. Okay, thank you. Let's see if there's any others. Any other questions from anybody before we hand over to Peter? <clears throat> oh, okay. The person that was asking about overseas has said the person's on 20% vision uh, and can it be improved? But that would. Yeah, so sadly it can't be improved, but it could still be important to save that 20%. Um, 
functional vision. Um, so I would still say see an optometrist first and then the optometrist will refer the patient off to the most appropriate ophthalmologist for their case. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, we will have time for more questions at the end. So I'll now hand over to Peter, who's our manager of vision and blindness technologies and our manager in our Queensland office here at Quantum. So who's going to talk to us about low vision aids for people? Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you very much, Sapna. Is my volume okay? Yes, that's fine. Great, thank you. Good. Yes, so um, I'm joining you from our site support centre at Wickham Terrace in Brisbane. Um, and we have uh, th three or four site support centres across Australia. So we have our main one at uh, Thornley in North Sydney, and uh, we have one at Mount Waverley in Melbourne. Um, and uh, we also uh, visit people in their homes if they can't come to our site support centres. So we have a, a range of uh, low vision consultants. So uh, when I say they're vision consultants, they do not perform an optometrical or an orthoptic function. Uh, they're not assessing eye conditions or anything like that. They're simply uh, consultants for vision aids. So that's our speciality. We, uh, we've had many years of experience with uh, vision aids. Some of them are electronic and some of them are just optical, but they're all aimed at improving quality of life in reading and doing hobbies and uh, managing your affairs and so on. So everything we do is, is around that side. It's um, more on the rehabilitation side, if you like, uh, certainly not uh, on the medical side, but of course we work closely with optometrists and ophthalmologists and low vision um, centers and so on to, to try and find the best solutions for people so they can continue to read independently and then enjoy hobbies and, and that sort of thing. So we do that. What, what we don't do, as I say, we don't provide orientation and mobility services um, or occupational therapy services. We collaborate with occupational therapists and O&Ms. Um, so we're quite clear about our role and, and how we collaborate with um, allied health professionals. So, um, But on that subject, uh, orientation and mobility is uh, very relevant to people with glaucoma, of course, because of the reduction in field of view. You, you miss things, you, you, you may bump into things or trip and fall and so on. So getting the... the uh, some instruction and service from an orientation and mobility instructor at any of the agencies, uh, Vision Australia or Guide Dogs or any of the independent uh, agencies uh, is very, very important. I'm gonna be talking more and demonstrating more about reading aids, that, that sort of thing. Uh, also a little bit about computer aids as well. And the way I'm gonna do this is I'm going to take you on a little tour of our site support center and we'll just pick up some bits of equipment and talk about them. Uh, before I do that, just to, um, just to recap on the the difference between someone affected by glaucoma and someone affected by macular degeneration, and unfortunately they're not exclusive. You can have both conditions, just as you can have cataract as well or uh, short sightedness uh, as well as glaucoma and so on. Um, but the fundamental difference is that the outer field is reduced in the peripheral vision is reduced with glaucoma, whereas with macular degeneration, it's the central field, the, the central vision. So some of the techniques that are very important for reading with macular degeneration are less relevant for people with glaucoma. But one thing that is common is a sensitivity to glare, contrast, and a need for getting the lighting right. So a lot of the things that we do are about adjusting those conditions to improve reading. So I'm gonna take you on a little tour. I'll introduce you to Leanne Lansdowne, who uh, she runs our site support centre here. And we'll try some, some of the equipment. So I'm just going to disconnect from here. And I'm gonna switch the camera around the other way. Okay. I hope I don't make anybody seasick as we move around with the handy cam. Yeah. 
this is uh, my colleague Leanne Lansdowne, and uh, um, she'll be holding. She'll be our cameraman whilst I demonstrate the equipment. <laughs> so just a, a brief look around our our centre here. So we have a range of uh, optical magnifiers, lighting, some electronic magnifiers. And in the other room, we have some daily living aids. So Leanne, I'm going to hand the camera. I know that you can't hear the, but you'll hear me speaking here. So the very first thing we look at when people have uh, low vision conditions is lighting. So I'm not actually talking about overhead lighting. Uh, that, uh, that, of course, does need to be adjusted as well. So I'm actually not referring to the ambient lighting in the room. I'm talking about task lighting. So one very popular task light we have is called the, Mag the Magnificent Lamp. And this has got a really strong LED light coupled with a two times magnifier. And this is really, and you can see it's very bendy. You can have it by your armchair or, or at a desk and so on. And it allows you to illuminate what you're working on. So it could be a puzzle or, or something like that. Um, but also give a little bit of magnification so that you can read expiry, uh, expiry dates on medication and so on. Uh, it, your hands are free to manipulate the object. And with this magnifier, it's only a two times magnifier, but for people with uh, glaucoma, that may be all they need, something around about two times. It, it very much depends on uh, whether there's some other conditions as well. So this is really, really handy, uh, the, the magnificent lamp. It, it can be actually assembled shorter, so you can actually have it so that the the bendy bit actually fits to the base and then it can become a desk lamp. This one is mains powered. We also have one a version which is rechargeable, uh, the, the Daylight Go. And this one has the same sort of concept, a magnifier with a, a good light, but this is rechargeable. So you can actually have it on the kitchen table to maybe to illum illuminate what you're eating. Um, or if you're actually maybe um, at, at say bingo or something like that, and you need something uh, to illuminate the, the general area of the table. Also, we have some very powerful portable lamps. This is not a magnifier, this is just a lamp. Very, very handy for task lighting. Now, these magnifiers are very weak. They're only two times. For people with macular degeneration, they might need stronger magnification than that. For people with glaucoma, it should be sufficient. But I'm just going to show you as we go up with the strength with magnification now. So these are some handheld optical magnifiers. These were designed for people with low vision. So they're much superior to the, the cheaper ones you can get from the news agent, uh, the $2 ones. These are proper lenses designed for people with low vision and they all have illumination in them as well. So the idea is that when I flip the switch, we get a very strong LED light. And the purpose of that, of course, is to illuminate what we're reading. So when we're so when we're looking at an object, we only need to illuminate just close the, to the object. We don't need to illuminate the room, just what we are working with at the moment. And then, of course, as in all magnification, your field is reduced. You get magnification, but the actual field of view is reduced because of the nature of magnification. In fact, if we go up to our strongest optical magnifier, this is a, a 48 diopter magnifier, it's so strong, that's about a 10 times, 12 times magnifier, uh, that I actually have to hold it. I have to hold it in my eye with my nose on the object to actually form an image. And the field of view is very small. I can only see like a few letters. So this would um, only be for spot reading. Uh, and you can imagine you wouldn't be reading a novel with something like this because it's just so uncomfortable. On the other hand, it's very, very portable. You can just pop it in your pocket. It has rechargeable. Uh, some, some of our models have rechargeable batteries and others just have regular batteries that you just place into the magnifier. So we have a range of those. People can come to our showrooms and just try those, those out. Um, and uh, we'll often find that people may purchase one of those just for everyday use, but they may also need something a bit stronger. 
So we're going to look at some of those things now. I'm just going to start with the, the biggest device, which is a 24 inch screen. We often find that people need big screens to have a good field of view. So what I've got here is I've just got a regular book and I've placed it underneath the clear view here. And now on the screen, we can actually fit the width of the book from edge to edge and it's magnified. We can also, and this is the, the important bit, we can also press a button to improve the contrast. So that's now really bold, bold black and white, or I can press the same button and go to white on black. Now, all of our electronic aids can actually make this switch to a high contrast setting. A lot of people with glare issues, and this includes many people with glaucoma, may not need much magnification, but they would like to reverse the background or make it a softer background rather than being too bright and glary. And so all of our equipment can make those adjustments, whether it's a big one or a smaller device. We'll often have people uh, with glaucoma uh, who I say they don't need much magnification, but they find that they can read, especially small print, uh, much better on a screen that's at this height, at this distance from their face. So uh, the, all they need to do is they have a sliding tray here to push the book further under or pull it to the top like this. When they've read this page, they can move over to the other side and then read this page. If they need it to be bigger, there's just a dial which twists to make it bigger. For people with macula, they might need it quite large and they actually need to slide left and right. But this is less common for people with glaucoma. Usually they can actually fit the whole width of the page across, across the screen like this, which means they don't need to go sliding left and right. So this is one of our largest uh, screens. So we call this a desktop electronic magnifier very, very effective for a very wide range of eye conditions. Now, of course, that may not uh, really be convenient for people to have such a big screen, or maybe they don't need such a big screen. So we actually have a range of what we call transportable and portable electronic magnifiers, which do much the same thing as, as the desktop magnifier, but in a more compact format. So the most compact one, would be uh, this Clover three and a half inch screen. And of course that will fit in a pocket so you can go to the club or to the chemist or whatever, and you've got a portable electronic magnifier. Of course, the, the field of view is much smaller on a small screen like this than it, was, than it is on a big 10 inch screen like this. But you can see the difference is these portable ones are all handbag size or pocket size and can be taken anywhere to a restaurant or a cafe. Uh, and they're very lightweight and, and a good compromise in screen size. So they've got a good six inch screen or a five inch screen, um, but they're still foldable, can be fit, fitted into a pouch and, and, and taken in, in a handbag or a bag. So I'm just gonna demonstrate this one here, the six inch one, the Clover six. So here we can either pinch the screen like a, on an iPad or if people prefer buttons, maybe they have tremors or they, they just have difficulty uh, with any sort of touch screen, they can use buttons and we can make it bigger. We can change the contrast. And again, here we have a soft background, but still very good contrast. They can either have it resting on the, on the, uh, the paperwork or they can swivel out the handle and just hold it above the above the paperwork. And that's quite handy if you're in the kitchen, you just pulled something out of the pantry and you just want to inspect it like this, or perhaps it's on a microwave and you want to read the, uh, you want to read the, uh, the display. So these are very handy around the home or out and about in the shops and so on. Then we come to what we might call more transportable. So these ones are not designed to be taken to the shops or anything, but they are handy to be able to read anywhere in the house. So for example, you might use this one on the kitchen bench with a recipe, um, but then you might have it in the study. You might even have it on a stable table on your lap. And here now we've got really good, really good uh, field of view and large magnifications. You can even write under these as well. So you could put a crossword under here and you could be writing with a magnified crossword. 
And we've got various versions of this. This is the Clover version. We also have the Compact 10 version. This one doesn't have a suspended stand. It has legs that stick out that allow you just to slide the um, device over a magazine or so on. It is also possible to position the print to the side and open up a camera to the right. And then you can see everything on this side here. So you could be filling in a crossword, that sort of thing on the right hand side. So here at the moment, um, I've got here, you can see my fingers and I'm actually filling in a crossword or, 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 or uh, maybe a form or something like that. Or maybe looking at a photograph Anytime I can also flip this back and then just use it for reading on top of the on top of the document like this. So that's a very lightweight, transportable electronic magnifier. Another popular one has a frame, and this is called the Clover Book. And this one has the philosophy of keeping the device up so that you can put a book underneath and read the book here. And because it's lightweight, it could be on your lap. And that's quite a popular option for people who have a, a specific chair they like to sit in. This one um, does fold up and can be taken from room to room with a convenient carry handle. So I think you can see that there's quite a range of uh, things that will adjust contrast, magnification and so on. They're very easy to use, that they really require very little training. Uh, so people, especially elderly people, can easily transition to using these. And our average customer age is 75 to 80. So that gives you an idea of uh, that uh, all of these pieces of equipment have been designed for people in that age range. Now, um, we do have um, people who struggle to use any magnification at all. With glaucoma, if there has been irreversible damage and a lot of damage, Oftentimes they can't really use magnification um, very successfully. So they can use what we call speaking systems, text to speech systems. This, these are also very popular with people with macular disease as well. But a speaking system basically can be either a special device like this. This is called the clear reader. And basically the idea is you simply place your reading material Underneath the clear reader, you press a button. It takes a picture of the page. It has some speakers here. And in a moment, it's going to read the columns from left, middle, and right, from top to bottom. behind schedule this does nothing to improve understanding and it may even trigger pity which is the death knell for any speaker speak from a position of strength and clock. i don't know if you could hear that well enough but it's coming out through the speakers here yeah. uh, i can control it by pressing the pause button the rewind button the fast forward i can even spell a particular word as well so you can imagine that this could be used by somebody with no vision because all the controls are tactile. All you need to do is butt the, uh, the document up against the clear reader, find the, the scan button, press it, and then it does everything for you. So that's called the clear reader. Now we do have a highly portable device called the OrCam Read. Now this has some of the same functions as the clear reader, but it's in a much smaller package. It's about the size of a marker pen. And inside it, it has all the computing power within this. It doesn't need to connect to the internet or anything like that. All the power that we have in this big machine is concentrated in this little machine as well. So the idea is that um, it's just starting up at the moment. There are some very simple controls. I'm sure the contrast is not too good here, but there's on and off button a trigger button and some volume controls here. So this process, what we do here is we actually aim the, uh, the OrCam read at the document. You may see a frame appearing mm -hmm. uh, like a red frame. When I yeah. release that, it takes the picture and starts to read. 
And you'll see how quick that was and how accurate it is. Uh, and of course, because it's handheld, you can take it anywhere. You, you could be in a cafe or you could be in your armchair. Uh, you could be in the pantry, pulling uh, packages of food out and so on. And all you do is just aim it, press the button, and it will start speaking, either through the speaker that's built into this or <clears> through <throat> a Bluetooth speaker. We actually have a, a, a like a frame this can sit in as well. So I don't have one here to show you today, but it just you just put it into the cradle and then it's at exactly the right height for taking the picture for, for a document like this. So that's the Orchem read. Now I'm going to take you through to the other rooms and uh, we can look at some of the other things that we have. Mm -hmm. It's just about five to 12, Peter. So, so thank you very much. OK, so I'm going to just briefly show you the uh, the daily living aids. We have some daily living aids from Vision Australia that we display here at Wickham Terrace. Um, so these are some of the most popular things uh, in the, the catalogue, talking microwaves, talking scales, uh, kettles, a, um, a talking radio, so that you know which channel you're on, you can find channels, large print telephones, and a uh, talking mobile phone called the blind shell. And of course, talking watches, talking book players, and talking labelers. So look, this is just a curated range from the Vision Australia catalogue that we have here for people to touch and feel and try. And oftentimes we find that people who are coming looking at reading aids are also interested in some of these other aids as well. And finally, I'm just going to touch on some of the things we can do with computers. So we have some large print keyboards. So for people that struggle to see the little letters, we have got some large print keyboards in various different colors and so on. We have magnification software for computer. So I'm going to show you the Zoom text program here. This is on my little laptop. Here we can make uh, everything on the computer bigger and we can change the mouse pointer uh, and the backgrounds and so on very easily for all applications in Windows here. So we have a whole heap of things we can do with computers to make uh, email and word processing easier. We can also change the background of the, of the colors and so on for, for glare reasons. And some of these things also apply to iPads. So there are ways of changing the background colors of iPads, but also of increasing the magnification. If you're a book reader, perhaps you might use like some of the Kindle type um, book reading. Here I've got a book on my iPad and we can change the size of the font. And we can change also the, the background color as well. So for example, if I wish to change from white to another color, I can choose it to a, a softer background or even to a black background like this. All of these things may be very, very beneficial for people with glaucoma who need to reduce glare and so on. So these are some of the things that uh, we can do. So we can't do everything. And of course, we refer to um, our colleagues in occupational therapy, uh, orientation and mobility um, to partner with us to collaborate to find some of the best solutions for people with glaucoma and other conditions. People are very welcome to just drop into our site support centres, but we would recommend that they just phone us up, make an appointment just so we don't double book. Um, but uh, they are very popular spaces. People really do love to touch and feel and ask questions and so on, rather than just shopping on a, an online catalogue. And you're very welcome to do that. Um, and we're open nine, nine to five, Monday to Friday. We also do home visits as well. So oftentimes people have mobility issues or they want to see things in their environment and we can do trials of equipment and consultations in people's homes as well. So Rebecca, I think, I think I've covered everything, but if you can think of anything, um, just chip in. But that's, that's just a quick sh show and show and tell of, of the sorts of things that we do. Yeah, thank you, Peter. That was, that was great. And our last webinar we did was all about staying online. So that's on our YouTube channel. If people, and obviously contact us if you want um, more information about anything. And I'll share our contact details in a moment. Um, yeah, the only other thing I was going to say is um, we can um, deal with different funding providers. So we're an NDIS 
um, registered provider, um, also for Department of Veterans Affairs, and um, we work with Job Access and uh, my. Some people can get things through My Age Care funding as well. So yeah, um, there's various different options for people, and obviously people can privately buy if that's um, if they're not funded as well. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so um, if anyone's got any questions, do put them in the Q&A or chat. Uh, we've got one, um, somebody's asked if we travel to regional Victoria to assist with AIDS, for example, Lakes Entrance. Um, yeah, we do have a Victorian office. Yeah, you can answer that. So our colleagues um, in Melbourne um, should be able to, to do that and would be worth discussing with them, perhaps not. But yeah, if anybody wants um, a demonstration of things, we would yeah definitely recommend, particularly in um, Sydney and Melbourne, making an appointment to come in because we're also not always in the in the office. So um, well, there might not be someone there that can show you things, but uh, yeah, we're more than welcome to come into the office. So, okay, I will just um, share my screen with our contact details and thank you once again to Sapna and Golcoma Australia for for being uh, joining us with this this webinar again so that's been been really great so to contact quantum you can um, visit our website quantumrlv.com.au um, 1300 883 853 or info at quantumrlv.com.au and yet yeah, we're open as Peter said, nine, nine to five, Monday to Friday. So um, I'll finish things there. So thank you, Peter and Sapna. And uh, thanks to everybody that's joined us. And we'll get the recording out as soon as that's ready. So thank you.